And we're back with a technical segment from Brandon McCann as a principal security consultant with AccuVant Labs attack and penetration testing team. Brandon specializes in penetration testing, antivirus avoidance, and advanced phishing email attacks. Brandon is the co-founder of PentestGeek.com, which we've talked about on the show before, and founder of the Phishing Frenzy Open Source Project. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for the warm welcome, guys. Yes, nice to uh, to have you on here. We're big fans of Pentest Geek, um, and Brandon, I'm told you have a uh, a little demo for us of Phishing Frenzy. What is Phishing Frenzy? Yeah, so Phishing Frenzy is really it's a, an open source Ruby on Rails phishing framework that helps you manage your uh, phishing campaigns. It's kind of geared towards uh, penetration testers. Um, I've noticed over the last couple of years of phishing that there was a, a, a lack of standardized process and it seemed very manual. Um, so what we've tried to do is basically build a nice little web interface to uh, launch and manage your phishing campaigns. Awesome. And I'm told you're going to show us a demo? Yeah, I can show you a little brief demo of, of kind of how you get it up and running and uh, basically just kind of show you how we fish and, and I track some analytics and things like that. Okay. It's all you. It's all me? All right. Well, I've pretty much got a default instance of Fishing Frenzy here, and I'm just going to log in and kind of get you guys familiar with it. <clears throat> Once you log in, uh, you've basically got a dashboard of, of any campaigns that you've launched in the past. Um, before, but before we get into kind of a campaign and, and setting up a, a phishing assessment, um, I just want to kind of give you a feel for the application. So if you jump over to the campaigns, you've got a list of all your campaigns, whether they are active or not, uh, ready to be managed. Uh, you also have uh, the templates page. So you've got uh, uh, different phishing templates, and a template essentially consists of uh, nothing more than a phishing email and, and a phishing website, because that's kind of the two core components of any phishing engagement. Uh, and then we've got your report section, so any campaigns that you've la launched, you can jump right in and you can kind of uh, take a look at the stats, um, who's clicked on it, and, uh, and things like that. So here's a, just a dry run, kind of give you, we sent it to two people, one person opened it and clicked on it, and we can kind of, you know, drive down into those details, but we'll get there. Um, we've got some resources like email enumeration. So if your uh, if your client doesn't provide you any email addresses, uh, you can pop in your Bing API key here and essentially pop in any domain, and it's going to uh, harvest some emails for you. So I've um, already got some email addresses, kind of as an example, because it takes a while, but. You know, at any time you can take these emails and you can just, uh, you know, show them where they came from or you can just launch them or, or apply them to any uh, campaign, download them, uh, so you're ready to go. For example, uh, I've got three campaigns here and at any time I can import them right in. So uh, we've got some automation there for email harvesting for you. Uh, we've also got a website cloner built in, so, uh, you know, if you wanted to clone, for example, a GitHub, uh, you can quickly just clone a page and preview it right here. Uh, inside the browser to see if it looks nice and things like that. You can also download it, edit it, and get it ready for a template. So um, that's kind of just some additional utilities uh, the Fishing Frenzy has to offer here. Um, we can probably jump right in here and, and basically create an assessment and uh, see if we can send some emails. Any questions that you gentlemen have before we jump in? Brandon, what's what's working nowadays in in phishing email attacks? Have you had to adjust your uh, strategies or are kind of the same old tried and true techniques still working? You know, some you know in the core fundamentals, the the true and tried techniques work to get them to click on the emails. But really, we're starting to see some beefed up technical controls. So, for example, uh, you know, clients are getting better and stronger, and that's good to see. But uh, you know, something for example. Uh, you want them to download a malicious executable. Well, uh, maybe they now have a web proxy server that doesn't allow downloads, and uh, and therefore they're blocking downloads before they can even you know click on them. Well, we can run things like HTTPS, you know, run it on SSL and try to get around it. So we're seeing a lot more technical controls. We're having to get fancy with you know antivirus avoidance. So if we actually do get an executable onto their system, uh, we've probably had to obfuscate it. Uh, if you're if you're generating payloads using your typical MSF payload or anything like that, you're going to get popped right away, and you know your your phishing campaign is going to come to a kibosh rather quickly. Have you found that users are more aware of targeted phishing emails, or are we still kind of at the same level in terms of user awareness? You know, the sad truth is, I think we're we're still in the same spot. It seems like no matter how much we train our end users, that we're we're really in the same position that. 
uh, an effective phishing campaign is going to get users to click on on an email link, and um, it seems like if you have enticing you know emails, they're going to click and they're going to come to the website. Interesting. Interesting. Is your focus strictly malware when you're running your phishing uh, campaigns, or are you looking towards browser-based type uh, attacks? You know, it really varies. Um, it, it depends on, on really what the client's looking for. So we'll do things simple, uh, user awareness tests. So they click on a link and it's, it's just a landing page that says, hey, you have been phished. This was a company XYZ test. You know, mm -hmm. um, Here's the red flags that you should have identified to notice that this was phishing. You know? So we do it in its most basic form where we're not actually trying to exploit. We're not trying to harvest credentials. We're not trying to get remote access. And then some of the more you know, mature clients who are really looking to get that so what, um, you know, maybe we'll bring them more of the full Monty. Uh, we'll try to do malware. We'll try to do the browser-based stuff. Um, so it really depends on what the client's looking to get and probably how, how mature their security model currently is. Right, right. Um, do you see kind of the transgress trans uh, progression, rather, of, you know, hey, we've never had a phishing uh, campaign done, and then you kind of go back and you kind of get more advanced as it goes? Do you see companies doing that? Yeah, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of clients that fish themselves maybe quarterly, monthly. You know, they're really, really harping on the user awareness, just uh, getting good examples, giving their end users a good look. Um, and, and, yeah, some of them ramp it up as they, you know, get a little bit better. Um, but ultimately, it, it never seems to be 100%. I would say if you're, you know, maybe in the 5 10% click rate, um, your company's probably doing really pretty respectable. But as we all know, it only takes one click. So, you know, 5%, 10%, that's, that's all the bad guys need. What are some mitigations on the desktop, you know, to speak to your last point where, I mean, it really, as much as you can train your users, and it's interesting, I remember running a panel and, and, and Dave Vitel was saying that exactly what you said, it only takes one user, right? And they click the link and the malware installs. So user, ed you know, his point was user education is kind of pointless. Um, what, what do you see uh, as far as protections go? Because you can't really train 100% of your workforce all the time because your workforce is constantly changing. So what are some of your defensive recommendations to combat against some of these threats? What are the most unique things you see your, your clients doing? Sure. So, you know, I'm going to sound really cliche and go, you know, a good security program is a multi-layered approach. So it's, it's not 100% user awareness training and it's not 100% technical, technical controls. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we'd love to say we can put up enough uh, technical controls, buy enough, you know, fancy equipment that, you know, this is no longer a risk. But, but ultimately, the way the email system works is we're always going to get email into the inbox. Users are almost always going to have, you know, internet access to browse. So the risk is, is here to stay. Um, yep. But to answer your question, some of the cool things that, you know, I've seen clients do or some of uh, technologies that have really kind of put a kibosh, uh, it's... Uh, We've seen some firewalls that are doing some SSL stripping, so they're actually uh, man in the middle in the SSL certificate, and so they're therefore able to see inside the encrypted stream. So when we do a lot of phishing gigs, we'll, we know that they have an intrusion detection system, intrusion prevention system. So what we'll do is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll run everything over HTTPS. So their fancy firewall, um, it now can't see inside that encrypted stream. So someone who's got a nice fancy, maybe a Palo Alto or something like that, or a Cisco ASA that's doing SSL stripping, but what happens is, let's say they do download malware and they run it, um, you know, they're in, able to see that reverse HTTPS go out the back door and they see that it's, you know, a command shell or whatever it is, it's malicious, they have a better chance of stopping it. So, you know, a small percentage of people are doing SSL stripping gateways, which really is effective if you're running intrusion detection on top of it. Um, some other really just kind of uh, configuration things that I've seen that are real nice is, um, you know, they'll configure their spam box to... Put a, they'll modify the subject line and it'll simply have brackets that say external. For every email that comes from an external source, um, they'll just modify the subject line. So if nice. someone's trying yeah. to impersonate, let's say, uh, a C-level executive or they're trying yeah. to be someone internal, now it's like, hey, I'm Joe from IT. And everyone's like, no, you're not Joe from IT because the subject line says ex external. So badass over that, but that's a great – I like that tactic because it, it's technology you likely already have. And it's super simple, and everyone can be trained on that easily. I like that. 
Absolutely. It's one of those things that you don't always have to buy the most expensive stuff. You just got to kind of leverage what you currently have and, mm. and think of creative solutions. And that's kind of one that I've seen. And uh, it actually works. If you, you give your users another additional thing to key on, and it seems to be pretty effective for based on my experiences. Now, what about things uh, once malware is running on the host? Uh, are there things that clients can do to make an attacker or pen, pen testers' lives difficult uh, to either spread from there or gain access to other resources on the host? Uh, the Skype just cut out there a little bit, but I think if I understand, um, um, you know, once we already got to the workstation, what can what can someone do to kind of mitigate their exposure once yeah. uh, once it's once it's a little too late? Sure, yeah. there's there's absolutely a number of things that people can do, and that. You know, some of the easiest ones would be don't give your end users local administrative privileges. You're going to, you know, mitigate someone's ability to uh, to harvest uh, credentials that are stored on the system or uh, to, to elo escalate privileges quickly. You know, if you're giving them admin access right out of the box, uh, you've almost lost. Uh, another thing you got to make sure is, is we got to stop past the hash attacks. So um, if someone does gain access to your local admin hash, you need to make sure that you're either denying logon through the network through GPO so that that local admin hash isn't able to just remotely log into systems, or you need to have you know a unique local admin hash on every system. So uh, you know network segmentation is huge. You know if we're on one system and we have no other systems to remotely log on to, you've almost you know siloed them. So. Uh, those are just kind of some of the key things that, that users can do or, you know, the companies can look into to do mm -hmm. to mitigate, you know, once malware is on there. And, and, and even to get it to stop completely, you know, there's things like application whitelisting. Um, I know it's not 100%, but, you know, if we get malware on their system and they go to run an executable, um, if it's not in the list of approved, you know, uh, applications, it's going to put a kibosh right there to the, you know, phishing attempt. Segmentation is tough when we talk about the client systems. Because those clients inevitably need access to things. <laughs> Usually uh, a lot of things. So that, that defense is, is a tough one for me. It is. You know, I, I totally agree that it's a business challenge, and, and there are very few companies out there that are probably doing effective network segmentation. Um, but again, it's one of those technologies that they probably all have in house. And if they really buckled down and really asked, you know, does this VLAN need access to this VLAN, um, you can really uh, mitigate your attack surface. Uh, did you guys have questions for Brandon? Uh, Larry, you do a lot of fishing. <laughs> yeah, we do. And actually, we uh, we actually really love uh, Fishing Frenzy. And uh, I had one of the guys send over. He had some, some questions. Um, you know, sort of feature -y type requests. Wanted to see sort of what the plans were going forward. Um, and it's been uh, – it, it was been a little bit since he made some of the notes from the summer. Um, but how, how about the thoughts about being able to um, copy campaigns with the ability to selectively copy targets or not? So say you've got a campaign that you run, but you want to maybe run it again with some reduced stuff and maybe make a few changes. Is it possible to copy some of those campaigns currently? It, it currently is not, um, but it's something that you know could certainly be done with time. And actually, it's the the first time I've actually heard someone want that feature. So um, it, I can see why it would be very enticing, especially in let's say a spear phishing example. So sure. you're setting up a a tailored template to maybe every victim, and you don't want to reconfigure each campaign and this and that. So yeah, it could be definitely attractive to be able to copy the the, the campaigns. We currently allow you to copy the templates and modify them. Uh, just not uh, copy not the campaign as today. Yep, yep. So one of the other ones was that uh, some of the things that we've seen in being able to get around some mail filtering and, and some of those types of things is the ability to sort of throttle the the delay for in which we're sending mail to through SMTP or something of the like. So, I mean, if you could just go and dump, you know, a thousand messages, they're likely going to get picked up by a spam filter of some sort. But um, some thoughts about adding a random delay or being yeah. able to configure a random so, delay? So I'm just going to jump into a campaign here and actually say that we've added that feature. Not necessarily random, um, but in this phishing options, uh, you now have the option to uh, an SMP, SMTP sending delay. So this is basically oh, zero to sixty seconds that it's going to wait between its uh, between each victim that it sends to. Excellent, excellent. So yeah, that was one of the things that I know we've seen in the past. It's been an issue. You could just go dump a thousand emails in ten seconds, and the mail server complains after about twenty messages. Absolutely, yep. And that uh, actually, a colleague of mine wrote that little a snippet, and it's quite valuable. <laughs> 
Yep. Um, the only other one, and it's yeah, it's not really. It's a it's a complaint, but not really a complaint um, that we've seen some smart folks do after getting to the site that they've gone to, and say the campaign is directing them to a, a URL, um, or if they go to the server where stuff has come from, and they move up a directory, and they don't get um, the the target default page um if they move up a directory it goes to the phishing frenzy login page sure um so really that comes down to a configuration with apache yep. and and what you can do is you can put a default website ahead of phishing frenzy's configuration file and that's mm -hmm. what i actually do here um i might be able to demo that but basically i've got a generic loading page that isn't loading anything but it, it it's very specific so that if you don't know the exact phishing frenzy URL, yep. you will never get the login unless you've got the fully qualified domain name. And Excellent. then I've got a catch-all sitting ahead of it in Apache that's just a generic loading page, so it doesn't tell them anything. Excellent. Excellent. Now, how's the, how's the documentation coming along? It's slow. Uh, <laughs> it's painful, <laughs> yeah. uh, like, any, like any project. Um, it's out there. Is it perfect? No. no. Um, we're really looking for some help there and, and, and some feedback. Uh, people who've tried out the install and something's not working, um, we're happy to take in that feedback. Uh, we'd love to see any of that information submitted to the GitHub page so that we're aware of it. Um, there is some basic documentation and some videos. I think there's enough to get you guys up and running, um, but it's, it's really quite... Uh, not mature documentation like we'd love to see for something complex like this phishing process. Yep. Yeah, I think one of the the ones that uh, that that we'd love to see, and this is a great opportunity for a SteelCon. I was just going to say so, that. So yes. you're, you're, the SteelCon contest would be where the, you provide the, documentation for open source, source project. Yeah. Um, would be some some more language around being able to configure both uh, beef and Metasploit integration with uh, phishing, phishing frenzy. Yeah, and I think that there's definitely opportunity there, and, and, and I'd love to see more documentation of the project. It's it's probably deterred some people who've tried it out. There wasn't enough documentation there, and, and maybe uh, deterred them from jumping in. Yeah, that that said, you know, incredibly easy tool to use. I, I love it, um, just because the, the homebrew solutions that we were dealing with before were not nearly as polished and were not nearly as easy to set up. So um, I think most pen tensions pen testers have their own kind of homebrew yeah. solution. <laughs> yeah. My, mine's in a Perl CGI script. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's been revi revised from a previous employer, and uh, yeah, it's it's messy. Yeah. It's messy. But it works. <coughs> Brandon, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Yes, sir. Let's give it a whirl. All righty. Three words to describe yourself. Funny, energetic, spontaneous. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Well, the butcher knife, of course. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Living in the fast lane. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I'm going first. <laughs> oh, hell pick, yeah. <laughs> pick, <laughs> pick two celebrities to be your parents. That's a tough one. That's yeah, the, that's, that's a the, really that's tough the one. Curveball right yeah. there. Yeah, that's a tough one. Especially if you don't have any time to think about it. Yeah, we've had yeah. ample time to think about it. Yes, we actually have multiple answers to that question. Yes. Well, uh, we'll go with uh, Katy Perry and Brad Pitt. There you go. Wow, Brandon, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. And we can find uh, your blog, pentestgeek.com, and Fishing Frenzy. I'm a, is there a website for Fishing Frenzy that we can give people or just Google for it? Or Yeah, the official uh, fishingfrenzy.com uh, is live and out there. That's the official documentation. Otherwise, everything else would go on the GitHub page for tickets or feedback. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brandon. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Yes, absolutely. Will With do, that, boys. we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about the stories for this week. Woo.